Welcome. Welcome to the uh, Select Committee on uh, Energy Independence and Global Warming. Uh, we have a, a very historic hearing that we are uh, going to have today, and we welcome all of you to it. Um, the United States possesses only 2 percent of the world's oil reserves. We have 5 percent of the world's population, yet we consume 25 percent of the world's oil. And we import much of that from countries that don't like us very much. That is our weakness. This weakness has turned American consumers into OPEC's ATM. Today, American consumers spend more than half a billion dollars a day to buy foreign oil. That is half of our trade deficit. Our dependence on oil distorts our foreign policy, skews our military policy, wrecks our economic policy, and damages our environment. Every $1 increase in the price of oil provides an additional $1.5 billion to Iran each year. Our oil addiction is supporting rogue nuclear regimes. It is helping to funnel resources to terrorists. But the dangers of our oil economy aren't just from unstable regimes in the Persian Gulf. This summer, BP's uncontrolled well spewed upwards of 60,000 barrels a day of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. All that oil, which covered beaches, marshes, and wildlife, all that oil, which put fishermen out of work and crippled the tourism industry, all that oil, over 4 million barrels of oil, amounts to just six hours of oil use in the United States. We cannot drill our way to energy independence. We must innovate and build the path to a clean energy future. Whether it is the gusher of dollars sent to petro dictators or the oil gusher at the bottom of America's ocean, the time to end this destructive addiction to oil is now. The panel today is working to end this addiction, 100 miles at a time. They are the winners of the Progressive Automotive X Prize. The X Prize Foundation is an educational nonprofit organization, a public private effort whose mission is to create groundbreaking new technologies that benefit humanity and inspire the formation of new industries, jobs, and the revitalization of markets. This competition focused on building new high-efficiency cars that reach 100 miles per gallon. Today was the conclusion of the 31-month-long contest to build a production-capable vehicle that can achieve this goal. For six years, and three different sessions of Congress, I fought to increase our fuel economy standards to 35 miles per gallon. I was unsuccessful year after year, 2001, 2003, 2005. The votes were not there on the floor of the House of Representatives. But then Nancy Pelosi became the Speaker of the House in January of 2007. And in December of 2007, we stood over the shoulder of President Bush as he signed the law to increase our fuel economy standards to 35 miles per gallon, the first increase in the United States since 1975. This was an incredible change, a 40 percent increase in the fuel economy standard. We cannot wait 32 years to go from 35 miles per gallon to 60 miles per gallon or 100 miles per gallon. A recent study found that by transitioning to electric vehicles, we could create 1.9 million new jobs by 2030. We could improve our trade deficit by $127 billion a year. And the typical U.S. household would pocket almost $4,000 extra dollars in gasoline saved and other benefits. In Congress, we are working to adv advance oil saving technology. In the Waxman-Markey bill that passed last June, uh, it includes $20 billion and other measures to deploy plug-in hybrid and all-electric vehicles 
and has other provisions to help save oil. Earlier this year, I introduced bipartisan uh, legislation, the Electric Drive Vehicle Deployment Act of 2010, uh, along with uh, Anna Eshoo and Republican members as well. That bill will demonstrate the viability of electric vehicles and accelerate their deployment around the country. Most importantly, it reorients our energy policy towards our strength, innovation and technology. We look forward to hearing from the XPRIZE winners today. Consumers are eager to learn how soon these 100 mile per gallon vehicles can get from your garage to their driveway. So we thank you for, um, for uh, being here. We thank you for your um, efforts uh, in uh, creating uh, this uh, revolution. Uh, and we, uh, uh, and we uh, are looking forward to actually having some other members uh, come here to this, um, to this hearing. We're having votes on the floor of the House of Representatives. Um, our first witness is Dr. Peter uh, Diamandis, who is the chairman and CEO of XPRIZE. In addition to his work with XPRIZE, uh, he has co-founded Zero Gravity Corporation, the Rocket Racing League, Space Adventures, and most recently, the Singularity University. Uh, he has a BS in molecular gen genetics and a PhD in aerospace engineering from MIT as well as an MD from Harvard Medical School. He is now focused on building the XPRIZE Foundation into a world-class prize institute whose mission is to bring about radical breakthroughs for the benefit of humanity. We welcome you here, Doctor. Whenever you feel ready, please begin. own passions and your connections to, uh, to driving innovation through incentive prizes. Uh, we are doing everything we are doing to really inspire innovators from around the world, people who are not the experts because, frankly, in my opinion, an expert is someone who can tell you exactly how something can't be done. And really, if you can put up a large enough carrot, big enough in prize and stature, you can attract innovators from around the planet who may have never been the primary individuals to attack these problems who come like these gentlemen here uh, with their new insightful thoughts. So our belief is that a small group of people with passion can do what only once governments and large corporations could do. Uh, the XPRIZE Foundation is a nonprofit educational institution. We are creating prizes now in a wide variety of areas, including energy and the environment, uh, life sciences, exploration, which is space and underwater, education, and global development. Uh, the first XPRIZE that we had, uh, Chairman Markey, was the Ansari XPRIZE for spaceflight. Uh, the Orteg Prize that uh, Charles Lindbergh and Charles Levine uh, competed for uh, was my inspiration. And uh, I announced that prize in 1996 without having the prize money or any teams competing. I was lucky enough to meet uh, Anush Ansari, who is sitting behind me, uh, whose family put up the $10 million of prize money that attracted 100 teams from around the world. We've gone on from there to partner with NASA. We have a vibrant public-private par uh, partnership with NASA. Uh, we've created the, and had awarded the $2.5 million Lunar Lander Challenge uh, jointly with NASA. We've gone on now to the $10 million Archon X Prize for Genomics, sequence 100 human genomes uh, in 10 days, $30 million Google Lunar X Prize, which NASA has once again matched that $30 million with a potential 30 of contracts to make it the largest incentive purse, if you would, in history. And recently, and definitely in, in line with the work that you do, sir, uh, Wendy Schmidt, Eric Schmidt's uh, wife, the uh, CEO of Google, funded a $1.4 million X Challenge for oil cleanup to reinvent how we clean up oil from a tanker or from a deep, uh, deep water horizon spill. So going back to the Progressive Insurance Automotive X Prize, uh, we are here today because my good friend uh, and business partner, Glenn Renwick, the CEO of, uh, of Progressive, who is here with me, 
stood forward to say, let's make this happen. And we announced it together at the New York Auto Show back in April of 2008. Amazingly, we had 111 teams, 136 vehicles that entered the competition from around the planet, 36 U.S. states, 11 countries, entered into two categories, a mainstream class, a four-seat, four-wheel, um, which had to go 200 miles range, get over 100 MPGE, and was up for a $5 million purse, and the alternate class, either side-by-side -side or front-back tandem, which had to go 100-mile range. They also had to emit less than 200 grams per mile of carbon dioxide, meet the uh, crash standards, the uh, FMVSS, and be affordable so that they could sell more than 10,000 per year. If I had to enumerate the accomplishments we had, I would put them uh, roughly uh, nine or so. First of all, it's demonstrating once again that incentive prizes can drive open innovation. Uh, and I have to ask the question, where else do we need open innovation? in energy storage, transmission, and fuels, whatever it might be, you know, we look forward to partnering with the U.S. government to make that open innovation happen, to attract entrepreneurs and experts from, frankly, the non-traditional places, because that's where breakthroughs come from. They don't come typically from within the large companies. They come from young entrepreneurs who are passionate and willing to take great risks, because the day before something is truly a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. If it were not a crazy idea, it wouldn't be a breakthrough. So where in large companies or in governments do we try crazy ideas? We don't. We have become fearful and we have become risk adverse. And because of that, our innovation has slowed. Prizes are a way to put that risk off to the side and fund crazy ideas. And people who step up to solve it, they get paid the money. If they don't solve it, the money's still there. We've attracted new investors, corporate sponsors, philanthropic dollars. Uh, we've tapped expertise from around the planet. We've galvanized the supply base. We've raised awareness. One of the things that I feel very excited about in our partnership uh, with Progressive Con Consumers Union is our new metric. And I would love to see the EPA and DOT adopt that metric of miles per gallon equivalent, MPGE, that allows people to really demonstrate what they have in an apples to apples comparison, especially as we go to hybrids and electric and mixed fleets. Finally, we've inspired students. I'm very uh, pleased that this afternoon four high school students are going to the White House. Uh, the four students from our West Philadelphia team, uh, our youngest team, uh, amazing success story, are going to be, res uh, be uh, recognized by the president in his innovation education sessions this afternoon. And uh, finally, I feel like we have demonstrated a tremendous public-private partnership with the Department of Energy uh, for whom we are extraordinarily grateful. Uh, we were able to leverage the DOE's money threefold through our, our private philanthropic donations and our sponsorship with Progressive, and I think um, that's a great model uh, for us to go forward and look for driving breakthroughs in other areas that would give us energy independence uh, and a great environmental history and future. Chairman Markey, thank you for your great support. I am grateful. Uh, and now we have a film, which, which we are going to uh, put up on the screen. If people can cut the lights, we'll, we'll go to the screen. And people can please turn off the lights over here very quickly. The Model T got 25 miles per gallon. And we think 100 years later, we must do better. This is a race for our future. It is a race we must win. Our current use of oil is unsustainable. It has become unbearably costly and environmentally devastating. Yet the automotive industry seems unable to present us with choices, with radical improvements in efficiency. It will take a spark to jumpstart a revolution. The Automotive X Prize is a $10 million prize to teams that can produce production-capable, safe, clean vehicles that can exceed 100 miles per gallon or its energy equivalent. The announcement sparks an immediate and powerful worldwide response. We're in. we got to do this. We're going to go for this in a big way. Take no prisoners. 
To meet the challenge, some teams use gasoline, electricity, even compressed air, carbon fiber, ultralight steel and aluminum, even a car made from foam. Built by well-funded companies, tiny startups, college students from Finland and Washington State, even a passionate team from West Philadelphia High School. In all, 111 teams from 11 nations enter this cutting-edge competition with a radical finish line. The $10 million purse was divided into three classes, a mainstream class that resembled more traditional auto designs and two alternative classes. There was an exciting variety of designs. All vehicles in all categories would have to deliver at least 100 MPGE. This new unit of measure, defined by the XPRIZE and endorsed by Consumers Union, allows comparisons and efficiency regardless of the energy source. The competition moves to the Michigan International Speedway, where cars are run through a grueling battery of tests for efficiency, safety, and performance. It's automobile gymnastics. We have to do 60 to zero braking, we have to do zero to 60 acceleration, double lane change through the long course. Many teams find it harder and harder to meet the benchmarks. Unfortunately, we have to eliminate you from the competition. You achieved 51.2 miles per gallon equivalent. Yes. Of the original 136 vehicles entered in the competition, 15 make it all the way to finals. Nearly every one of these vehicles delivers over 100 MPGE. 121.2. All right. 197.1. Okay, I can live with that. What many considered to be virtually impossible just a few short years ago has now proved to be very possible. We couldn't ask for a better way to accelerate the vehicle's development on the Aptera than to put it in this competition. We've done a year's worth of development in three months. It is absolutely the reason that we are as far as we are. We've now been third party justified that all of our claims are true. That's going to help us with fundraising. People didn't know who Zap was, and now they do, thanks to the X Prize. That's huge. In the alternative side by side category, a final race against the clock pits five cars in a race of speed and endurance, which proves too much for some. Is that okay? It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Zap is officially done. And the margin of victory is astonishingly small. Two tenths of a second. Differential? Down to two tenths of a second. Which way? Damn! The mainstream category comes down to just one team left in contention Edison 2's very light car. If they can make their benchmarks, they will win the $5 million purse. It is theirs to win or lose. <laughs> Great job, guys. Good job out there. <laughs> but the competition isn't over. Everything hangs in the balance pending the results of validation in the lab. Only then can the winners be determined. But all of the progressive automotive XPRIZE teams are winners, and we will all benefit from their innovations. They have accelerated a future with vastly more efficient vehicles and again demonstrated that to drive innovation, offer the right prize, and human nature will do the rest. The X Prize Foundation, making the impossible possible, one prize at a time.
Thank you, sir. Um, I, I deviated from the script in that speech, and I'd like to make one remark. Uh, Dr. Diamandis attracted us with a prize, and he pulled us from a different industry that solved similar problems, i.e., we knew how to do it, we were experts, but we were not trying to build efficient cars. This was entirely done because of the prize. It's a powerful statement because here we are little mice and our business plan basically is that we would like to get the General Motors of the world to join us and uh, join our frame of mind and our absolute depth of understanding of how to create a very light car and a leap and then produce it in a million copies and eventually export it to other nations. So now I will go to my script. The X Prize speaks loud and clear that business as usual will not eliminate our dependence on foreign oil or address climate change. We must work hard to solve these problems and one way is to make automobiles much more efficient. You cannot achieve breakthrough efficiency without departing from cars as usual. As you reach as you can see by the vehicles displayed, many teams experimented with new design approaches and the consequences of the focus on efficiency. The general perception that we are only a few additional components, modifications, or itinerations away from a solution is dangerous thinking and will not serve us well. We recognized early that in this competition there was an absolute opportunity to change the paradigm. We also recognized that we needed to offer a statement in a language everyone can understand. Against the advice of just about everybody, we chose to compete with an internal combustion engine. We did this because we embraced the merit of MPGE, but also understood that most people really understand the goal of 100 miles per gallon. It is very important to understand that we did this on an internal combustion engine, and I will refer to your statement, explaining the promise of electric cars is huge for America. We have a different technology, which is the technology of a very light car, a very aer aerodynamic car, and it in itself very much has the same size promise, unrecognized by anyone, except a gentleman from a very large foreign car company who sat in the audience today. I shouldn't say except, there were others, but the fact that he was there meant something. Our message. Would you like to introduce him? Oh, he's not here. No. But Your Honor, we, we really, we are perhaps somewhat patriotic. This country has been very good to me. I'm a German national. Uh, I want to see the jobs come back. I want to see the industrial base come back. I want to see the factories full. We really would like to see this become a public-private joint venture or partnership that pushes American industry. We see an opportunity to not be in the controlled implosion of our industry, but actually reach out and reach new heights and bring a company like General Motors or others back to where they once were. Our message is simple and clear. The very light car requires less energy to push than any car in history. There are reasons why the very light car gets better gas mileage than the motorcycle from which its engine came. There are reasons why the very light car more than a, can travel more than a, than a mile and a half while coasting down from 70 miles per hour to 10 on a level test track. Think about that. This may be the most efficient four-person automotive platform ever built. What we propose very lightweight, very low drag, with designed in safety, could make the USA a leader in a new, heretofore unknown segment of the automobile industry. We are offering the technology which can make the electric car viable. We hold the key to building an electric car with reasonable range and with lower cost battery because its energy requirement is smaller. We see the United States exporting the best electric cars in the world using these breakthroughs in weight, safety, and aerodynamics. The great opportunity is there. We have opened the floodgates, and now, if as a nation we run with it, we will reap the benefits of one of the greatest leaps in technology in our lifetime that is available to us, proven by the X Prize.
and if you analyze the data, it's there. Disruptive technology is what the XPRIZE is all about. The car you see here is a proof of concept. The car was built by talented engineers, designers, and mechanics from auto racing and aerospace. The car can carry four people to Detroit on a single tank of E85 ethanol fuel. Consumer reports showed that the car performance performs formidably. It emits half the CO2s of a CO2 of a Toyota Prius. It had the lowest greenhouse gas emissions in the entire XPRIZE competition, including electric cars. It has half the aerodynamic drag of a Toyota Prius, and it gets 129 miles per gallon on the highway. We can improve upon the car, and there is much work to be done. We can retain most of the vehicle's best efficiency attributes while making it more mainstream. We can prove that the engineering and design that allow a race car driver to walk away from a high-speed crash can work in a generation of lightweight cars, which you and I can drive. We, not just Edison 2, but Lee Ion Motors, X Tracer, and others, are on the verge of something special, something that can create jobs, fill factories, and drive new industries. It can and will happen with all of us working together. The role of the public sector is critical in this. From the Congress to the United States Department of Energy and Transportation, and we thank you for having supported the X Prize because without it, it wouldn't have happened. The federal government is catalyzing and accelerating the R&D and infrastructure development necessary to put truly efficient vehicles in driveways at home and abroad. We thank you for this continued collaboration and support. Where this all ends remains to be seen, but make no mistake, the race is on. Thank you, Mr. Kuttner, very much. Our next witness is Ron Surven. He is uh, a development, a project development engineer for Lion Motors of North Carolina. Lion Motors is a company engaged in the development and marketing of electric powered vehicles and products. Their vehicle, the Wave, is today's winner of the X Prize Alternative Side by Side Class. So, congratulations to you, Mr. Surven, for your uh, victory uh, today. Um, uh, we congratulate you, and, uh, and you may proceed whenever you feel comfortable. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thanks for everybody coming. Since 2003, Lion Motors Corp. Has That's what monitors the batteries. That's what keeps the cars safe during any time of operation as well as charging. During the knockout stage, Lion Motors Wave 2 achieved a number as high as 191 miles per gallon equivalent with electricity and, uh, uh, during the highway testing, uh, during real world conditions on track. That in itself I thought was a pretty impressive statement. Yet we continue to improve our vehicle's performance with enhancements to our already exceptional battery management system with the goal of increasing the overall vehicle efficiency by an additional 10 to 20 percent. We have a lot of room to grow with the car that people have seen today. Uh, I know that a little more time in the tunnel, a little more time with the car, uh, we probably will and plan on surpassing the 200 miles per gallon equivalent with that car. Our company's goal is to remain in the forefront of the tremendous technology and now and in the future to bring the next generation of affordable all-electric transportation to the market. In 2009, Lion Motors submitted proposals to the U.S. Department of Energy for available stimulus funding that would create more than 1,000 jobs to develop and produce these vehicles for us. Our hope is, and is that what we have accomplished here today in winning the Progressive Insurance Automotive X Prize, that possibly the DOE and others will uh, re-look into our proposal and possibly approve it so that we can move forward with our enterprise and with the business. We also had applied for a General Service Administration program under 7E, which is for electric vehicles to be purchased. Um, all specifications on the car passed, um, with the one exception there's a statue of limit on pricing for $13,000. Uh, other than that, the car could be available within the GSA for, uh, for purchase. We did and have since then assisted with the drafting of an executive order that would exempt 
electric vehicles from that requirement. Uh, we would ask your assistance in expediting this executive order so that maybe we may move forward with our plan for creating the more jobs in America. It's clear that Lion Motors Corp has proven that the technology to shift America away from its dependency on oil is here, and not just for the environmental impact, but economic and safety of our country as well. We've gotten this far without any government assistance or corporate sponsorship. We are resolved to see in our mission through and hope to gain assistance uh, in this effort one way or another. Uh, competition for the X Prize has really raised the bar for us in making a uh, far superior car faster than what we had originally planned and uh, what the consumer overall will gain from that is potentially a faster to delivery car, a safer delivery car, and a more economical car to drive. Uh, and this is something that could happen feasibly within the Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scriven, very much. And our final witness is uh, Jim Larimer. Uh, he is a U.S. sales representative for the uh, Paravis. Right, that's correct. Paravis company in Switzerland. Their 200 <coughs> mile per gallon X Tracer is the winner of the X Prize Tandem Alternative Class. We congratulate you, Mr. Laura. Thank you. For, uh, um, through his association with uh, Paravis, uh, Mr. Lorimer has claimed the title of America's fastest eco pilot <laughs> and has ridden in or piloted eco mobiles in the Czech Republic, Germany, Australia, Italy, and Switzerland. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Larimer. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you very much. The uh, X Tracer is a, a proven, highly efficient, and safe vehicle. It has been proven by A, winning the Progressive Automotive X Prize tandem seating category, and B, by literally millions of real world miles by a gas powered version of the same vehicle. Most of those miles were on European roads, but uh, 10 Tens of thousands of those miles were also on U.S. roads. The X Tracer is essentially an electric powered enclosed motorcycle. The electric powered enclosed motorcycle is not only efficient and safe, but it is also very high range capability, uh, 200 miles. It's comfortable to ride in, in most any type of weather, and it is also fun to drive. And, and because of those attributes, there is definitely a market for this vehicle concept. And that's a great thing because this concept of the uh, enclosed motorcycle is really good for our environment, highways, and even parking lots. Parabes, the company that created the X-Tracer, is ready to, to take the X-Tracer to market and has identified the U.S. as potentially the biggest market for the vehicle. Given that, Parabes is looking very strong at setting up assembly of the vehicles in the U.S., which of course means jobs and economic growth for the U.S. What we would like to ask of you is that, that you help ensure that, that no legislation existing or new interferes with making this enclosed motorcycle, motorcycle concept a viable alternative for the buying public. The X Tracer, along with many of the other entries in the Progressive Insurance Automotive X Prize, required new ways of thinking to create them. Now they may require new ways of looking at and formulating legislation in order to help make these vehicles a reality and in doing so, address some serious concerns that we all have with our dependency on oil. Thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ormer, very much. Um, I mentioned earlier uh, today that my wife's grandfather competed for the Ortigue Prize in 1927, and there were three finalists, uh, and he unfortunately had a plane crash one month before he was ready to take off with my wife's mother in the plane, this very small plane, uh, which necessitated it being repaired. Uh, and during that time period, Lindbergh passed him, got on the runway, and took off and landed in Paris. But Charles A. Levine landed in Berlin two weeks later, showing how much further you could go than anyone had imagined just two weeks before that. And so from his perspective, because he did not die until 1992, and I could have introduced him to you, uh, Mr. Uh, 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 um He was really interested in how to commercialize flight between the United States and Europe. He thought it would be a great market 
It wasn't quite the same motivation of Lindbergh, but I think it matches the motivation of some of our witnesses here today. How can you translate this into something uh, that can be sold to the public? How can you make money off of this to you know, put a fine point on it? So I guess my first question to you is, what is the uh, interest that you've been able to find in the American automotive industry? Uh, have any of them reached out to you? Have any of them indicated any desire to partner with you uh, to uh, advance uh, your technology and to bring it to market? Because ultimately, uh, that is the test. So, uh, Mr. Kuttner, would you like to deal with that question? Uh, very much so. Uh, credit is due where credit is due. Uh, Vice Chairman of the Board of General Motors Corporation approached me while walking around with a wheel that looked different from any wheel he had ever seen before. Uh, we began a dialogue and we have a friendship today. He uh, opened the doors for us at the General Motors Aero Lab. We took the car there. The chief of aerodynamics at General Motors was on vacation. He stopped in at 4 o'clock. His plan was to be there for 15 minutes. He left at 2.30 a.m. <laughs> okay, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The gentleman said a number of things. One of the things he said, you have just given me the tools to explain to the board that there is some other low-hanging fruit. We've always suspected that there was a way to do this, but we've never gotten the funding to even look. You see a picture of our car at GM's Aero Lab. It's set by far the lowest aerodynamic drag numbers that that lab has ever seen. It's a facility which would cost $250 million to duplicate today. That said, we've been in the room with a number of engineers before and closed arms are more the rule than the other. I believe it's a process. I think it tames, takes time. I think, uh, I think it's fair to say today that we have two higher level friends at General Motors, but I think we're a long way from anything. Um, the way we see it is our company is just going to be more, more valuable the day when they decide to recognize that we have a very formidable team and while we pursue this, we're accumulating intellectual property. Uh, we really see the path forward with some public-private help. The biggest challenge is safety in the very light car. The one who can solve the riddle of creating a thousand pound car that is really safe and, this is important, make the consumers believe it and understand it, that is a step toward efficiency that is unbelievable. And we know we can do it. There's work remains to be done. It will cost money. If we do it, demonstrate it, and share it, there are jobs for a lot of people and opportunities that are great. How much of the, uh, the victory was because you wanted to win $10 million as opposed to having the validation of your technology for everything that comes after it in the future, including having vice chairman of large automotive companies walk around and uh, find out what you are doing? The, the, the truth is it was all about the money initially, and now none of it's about the money. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is about getting it right. It's the greatest opportunity of a lifetime. I thank the XPRIZE for Foundation for pushing me toward this opportunity. I had no idea it existed, and it comes from the prize. I'm not proud to say it, but it's the truth. I would like to also say that uh, he's not General Motors is not the only company that has spoken to us. We've had a number of foreign interests, but General Motors is my first mm -hmm. choice. But I don't know. I think this is going to have to grow, and it's going to take time. And eventually, actions will speak louder than words, and facts are stubborn things, and that's the end of it. Well, when I asked Charlie Levine that same question, he gave the same answer you just gave, which is a tribute to the Ortiz Prize and a tribute to Dr. Diamandis, because it turns into something far more than the money. Uh, it's something far larger than that. Do you agree with that, Mr. Servan? And have you had any contact with any automotive companies? Uh, we, we have not been in any direct contact. Um, we really more focused on our technologies and to really make sure that uh, it, it was absolutely ready to go and perfected. Um, we, we have, as I said before, we have applied for some, some funding assistance and things like that, but we haven't really made any contact to any of the large manufacturers, uh, not as of yet. Um, we did focus on the X Prize, thinking that uh, there is that possibility that that might be the key that opens that door, and um, that's our goal for today. 
by the way, Mr. Larimer, um, before he competed for uh, the Ortigue Prize, when he was 28, he purchased the Indian Motorcycle Company, uh, which is what he owned at the time that he was in that company. Okay. Have you had anyone approaching you thus far? In terms um, of not uh, any U.S. major auto industry uh, players. Um, we are already working with a number of um, suppliers in the U.S. that um, that play a big role in this vehicle. Um, the, the vehicle concept has been around for, I think, 28 years um, in a gas-powered version. The uh, Turning it into an electric, electrically powered vehicle was probably already on the minds of uh, the guys at Pravis when, um, when they heard about the XPRIZE, and uh, the, the XPRIZE definitely accelerated the development of the vehicle and has, I think, turned around uh, an amazing vehicle in a very short amount of time. And so that's uh, a big credit for the XPRIZE to, to help them to make that happen. Okay, thank you. Um, we've been joined by uh, Congressman Tom Perriello from the uh, state of Virginia, uh, and someone who has dedicated um, his career thus far in Congress to um, energy efficiency, new energy uh, technologies, new automotive uh, technologies. And I will recognize him now for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me, and more importantly, for being a, a real hero up here to the efficiency and innovation movement. Uh, we sometimes talk about it as the, the green movement, but really at its core, it's about whether we're going to be an innovation oriented economy. And I think there's no question that the one thing America does better than anyone else on earth, you'll probably say play baseball, uh, is to out invent um, uh, the rest of the world. And I really do want to congratulate the X Prize program uh, for setting this and for everyone who participated. Uh, I will admit my bias uh, to Mr. Kuttner. We are very proud uh, of his work in Central and Southern Virginia. And uh, I don't think it's too far to talk about the fact that um, uh, you are in Jefferson country. And Thomas Jefferson uh, was one of the great inventors of concepts of liberty. He was a philosopher, but he was also a pragmatist who understood how to put those principles into action in the real world. And I think uh, your ability, all of your abilities, to think beyond the standards of your own time and the assumptions of your own time to imagine the next big thing, the next great thing, um, is nothing short of, of astounding. Uh, and Mr. Kuttner, one of the things in our conversations that's been very exciting to me is your ability to think of this not just as what was set out in the prize, reaching a certain miles per gallon um, or, energy or energy equivalent, um, but also could, is this something that could be affordable? Is this something that could be commercialized? And one of the things that uh, I think Mr. Markey was getting at that I'd like to ask you all about is the extent to which uh, we need what it's going to take to get from a point of having this intellectual property to the point that we could see these sorts of things uh, truly entering into the market space, whether it's the wheel or the brake or the entire car model. Um, and what do you think is the timeline? And, and Mr. Kuttner, if you'll start some to talk about how we go from, from the genius of these inventions uh, to actual commercialization. Um, there's much work to be done. Uh, you. Tom, you have seen our suspension. It is, uh, Chairman Markey, our suspension is this big. It, you can pick it up with one hand. In a normal car, that's an item that weighs well over 100 pounds. We could probably take about 400 pounds out of the average car on American roads today. The obstacle is that we, I'll tell you a short story. There was a very, very intelligent engineer in England uh, he had a Greek name, I think Ionysis. I, uh, he, he was knight. He, Alec was his first name, and he became a knight. Uh, Isigonis was his name. He came up with a car called the Mini. The Mini is not just a cute little car. It's the very, very first car with a transverse front-wheel drive uh, arrangement. It's an architecture. It has a sideways sitting engine with a transmission and strut towers. Those strut towers are today found in more than half the cars. It's a new type of architecture in the late 50s, and it's in almost all the cars. We are proposing a shift like that with brutal consequences. What we're proposing is a different architecture that has huge implications. The problem with it is that you really have to go to work because you no longer can take your car and rely on the previous car and change 10%. But now you have to think and really, really get busy. Therein lies the work. Therein lies the obstacle. Therein lies the opportunity. This is an opportunity to make the United States a leader in an automobile again. 
we created cars for the XPRIZE that provided handling numbers that would make any sports car company very proud on little smart, smart car tires. We know how to create a car that could replace the SUV, which in turn replaced the minivan, which in turn replaced the station wagon. We can bring you back a station wagon that's really fun to drive. And by the way, instead of getting the 15 or 18 miles per gallon those cars typically get today, we could probably give you 50 or 60 miles per gallon for those cars. We can provide answers that don't exist today. We can help the electric car movement really realize its potential. Electric cars make a lot of sense. They keep the money here. They make a lot of sense. But what we do is completely different from anything you've heard before. I, I won't hog this microphone, but this is what we propose is very, very serious. I think Tom Perriello understands it. He's been in our shop a number of times. It's such a departure, Chairman Markey, that the DOE doesn't even have a funding opportunity for us. The difference between us and the X, uh, between the DOE and the X Prize is the X Prize tells you where you want to go, but it doesn't tell you how to get there. They basically say, go do this. How you do it is entirely your business. The industry today, you cannot start a new car redesign without a whole bunch of people telling you how to do it. When they tell you how to do it, your hands are tied. Chairman Markey, we have a great opportunity. Thank you, sir. Uh, others who want to answer that question about the move to take this technology to commercialization? I, I would agree as well. We have worked with our technology for over seven years now, and that's monitoring the batteries and monitoring the systems that operate your vehicle, as well as the complete design of a new vehicle, uh, new chassis, more dependable parts, uh, easier to manufacture uh, components, less expensive to manufacture components <laughs> that require less mechanical and tooling to make them in the first place. Um, I, I feel like the evolution of the automobile is here and starting today. The, uh, the big part of it is, is getting the additional funding and the additional help and, and if not just the recognition that it, these ideas are out there and they're driving them today. And uh, to be able to show uh, today what was achieved out at the track in Michigan where not everybody could be, I think was uh, just a great thing and uh, would thank the X Prize for that, but also thank uh, you for uh, allowing us to speak today and uh, just hear what we have to say. Well, let me follow up on uh, Congressman Perriello's question and ask whether or not any of the tax incentive programs, uh, loan programs that we have put on the books here in Congress over the last four years have been in any way helpful to you, any way uh, something that you could qualify for in terms of helping you to meet these objectives. Please uh, take that question and, and uh, go in any direction that you want. Mr. Sterling. Okay. Um, I, I do believe that some of them could potentially help us in the future. Some of the stuff in the past that we have applied for or have um, looked into getting for, for one reason or another, we weren't able to achieve uh, what was required to uh, get that to move forward. The difficult part is you've got a company that's putting a lot of heart and a lot of funding into it, and because you're developing product, you don't have a lot of return at the, at the beginning. So it's, it is very difficult to demonstrate uh, why, you know, how, how you can repay a loan immediately or how a lot of that type of stuff happens. So it's getting to that level and maybe, uh, maybe do it in smaller steps to where you get a grant in order to get this technology out there and show that it's viable and start producing some vehicles and then maybe you get into more of a large format uh, loan program to where you can really up your manufacturing into the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of units. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kuttner. Uh, Mr. Markey, I, I, I would like to actually say that the truth is uh, you have helped us by helping XPRIZE, and that might be the path. Maybe we have to earn our keep before we get further. So thinking back, another thing that's important, I believe the President is uh, in the process of getting the R&D tax credits actually bolstered up. I believe the R&D tax credits are important. They have certainly helped me raise money. So you have helped us. However, specifically, 
I believe the DOE is now looking at how to help us because I think they've recognized that there may be one other opportunity. But uh, it's not that simple. You did help us in one other thing, this just the general climate of the fact that the government wants to put science first was huge. So I thank you for that, and I think this is all about the future. Thank you. Um, just a warm up. Uh, I really don't have anything to add to their, to their comments. I agree with everything they've said. Um, when uh, when uh, Charles A. Levine wanted to cross the Atlantic, he mm -hmm. actually went and visited with the Wright brothers to have them help to design the plane. But they were using different metals than they were using in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, about 20 years before, uh, in order to figure out a way of making it light enough so the fuel could get them all the way to Paris or to uh, Berlin. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that and the revolution in new metals and manufacturing technologies that are going to be necessary in order to uh, make this revolution something that ultimately is safe enough and affordable enough for American and global consumers to purchase? Uh, in our case, for something to have high impact, the price must be low. Steel is a wonderful material. It can be mass produced easily. The skills exist. Uh, the cost is low. The infrastructure is there. So steel is our primary structure. We have a primary steel chassis, uh, which basically keeps the car in structure and keeps the occupants safe. We use a lot of aluminum, some cast magnesium, um, we believe that with a different architecture like we're proposing, we may open the possibility of a different exterior skin. But for the most part, we believe metal is the way to go because the car can be recycled and the cost is low. And I think that's crucial. Um, it's an architecture-derived lightweight. Um, Mr. Servan, do we need a breakthrough in metallurgy in order to make this revolution work? And is the... XPRIZE helping to advance that goal by looking at new ways of manufacturing these uh, devices? I, I think what we saw with the XPRIZE is uh, a good mixture of, of new technologies and old technologies. Um, I, I think the majority of them, where there still is quite a few steel chassis out there as well as is ours, it does provide a low cost, safe, uh, cage around the vehicle in order for it to uh, keep the passengers safe. But we're also looking at a lot of new exterior ma materials, uh, more in uh, derivatives of cloth, such as fiberglasses and carbon fibers. Uh, we are working with a company right now on developing a new hybrid cloth that will be using a soy-based resin, uh, both a little bit more uh, green in the materials themselves but by using the hybrid cloth, we're going to use the strengths of certain materials uh, along with the strengths of other materials, and then the direction in which we're weaving it and sewing the cloth is also adding to the strength of the cloth without adding extra mass to the materials. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that we're going to see a lot of that now. Um, I think even big automotive manufacturers are looking at more at uh, composite materials and different types of composite materials. So I think... Uh, we're still going to see a lot of steel, and I think we're going to see a lot of new technology as well. Okay, thank you. Mr. Larma. Yes, uh, our, I think our vehicle could definitely benefit from uh, developments in, in, in metals. Uh, right now, it's a composite body structure of uh, Kevlar and carbon fiber, which makes it very strong and uh, very durable, but also uh, somewhat pricey. So if, um, if there's developments um, in, in other materials that could help make a more affordable model, uh, we would love to see that happen, and it would be beneficial. Okay, great. So, um, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each one of you to give us your one minute that you want the Congress to remember, that you want the American public to remember uh, as we conclude this hearing. Uh, and, uh, and I want everyone to know that uh, the vehicles, the winning vehicles, are right outside the building <laughs> right now, and we're, we, you're all invited to just go down one floor, out the back door, and the vehicles are there. Uh, that we can all uh, walk around and look at, and, uh, and especially all of you uh, congressional staffers who are here, representing all the members of Congress, I, I want you to see the future uh, and uh, know that it's here now, uh, and we're not talking, talking about uh, rocket science. We're talking about 
We're talking about uh, automotive mechanics and metallurgy. Uh, and so it, it's here now. Uh, and we just have to find ways of ensuring that we give the incentives for the continued improvement of these technologies that solve so many of the problems of our country and of the world's problems. So we'll go in reverse order of the original uh, opening statements and we'll give each one of you one minute to give us uh, the thoughts that you want us to uh, remember as this hearing concludes. Mr. Lorimer. Thank you. Uh, I think the one thought is that uh, we believe the, uh, the, the closed motorcycle or aerodynamic motorcycle is the, the most efficient uh, vehicle platform out there. Um, for, for various reasons. It's, it's, it can be lighter in weight than uh, four-wheel vehicles and three-wheel vehicles, and it's uh, more aerodynamic. Um, and while it, it's not for everybody, it uh, really could um, have, a, have a huge impact on our environmental issues if we can take this, this concept we have and develop it further to um, something that a large part of the consumers can eventually uh, get into and utilize. Thank you. Mr. Servin. I would say the, the biggest thing for us is to look at the whole package. Look at the aerodynamics that we've developed in our car. Uh, right now, compared to a car with the same frontal area, is about a third of the horsepower to push this car at 85 miles an hour. Uh, we've gone and then into the skin, into our batteries and our battery management systems, uh, all proprietary for us, but um, we just, we feel that we have been focused on the battery electric vehicle with the lithium powered uh, since 2003 now. And uh, it really seems to be that they have chosen the right direction and it's really proven very successful for us. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kuttner. While a lot of work remains to be done, uh, we have proven that we can come up with a safer after work, more efficient, better handling car, uh, essentially a better car at a lower cost. I said the race is on. I believe it is very, very clear that what we are proposing will happen and will become a real automotive segment. How fast it will become, who owns it, and who wins this race depends on who joins us and when. The opportunity is here, the race is on, time is running. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Diamandis. Chairman Markey, thank you. Uh, incentive prizes are an incredibly efficient and highly leveraged and powerful tool to drive breakthroughs and to take risks where risks are needed for breakthroughs. Uh, the Department of Energy, the U.S. Government made a $9 million investment here through DOE for which we are extraordinarily grateful and we believe there is at least over $100 million of return so far and hopefully a billion dollar industry that these gentlemen will start to pioneer. We stand ready and convinced that in your mission, sir, in stemming the need for oil and in reinventing climate, that incentive prizes can play an incredible role to bring the smartest people around the planet to solve these problems. It's a matter of what are the right targets, and we stand ready to work with you and the Department of Energy to do such things. Uh, thank you uh, so much. Uh, back in 1970, the United States imported approximately 20 percent of the oil that we consume. Uh, a couple of years ago, it went up to 60 percent of the oil that we consume, and we put 70 percent of the oil that we consume into gasoline tanks. So the problem is pretty simple to define in terms of how, how we have to reinvent the things to which those gasoline tanks are attached, huh? the vehicles that we drive here and around the planet. Uh, and there's no question that uh, by the year 2099, this revolution will be completed we will have figured out how to do it. It just becomes a question of how much time it will take to reach that point. And what you three represent today is really an inspiring example uh, of ingenuity uh, that helps to make it possible for millions of people to see what is possible. Uh, and not what is possible in a Buck Rogers, you know, 22nd century sense, but what is possible right now. And so we, we thank you for your leadership. We thank you, Dr. Uh, Diamandis, for your leadership on this issue. Um, we are going to continue to focus uh, on uh, this issue uh, like no other, because this is the central issue. It touches national security, economic security, balance of payments, and climate policy. It's all wrapped up into one issue. Uh, and you give us a vision of what the future looks like. We're going to do everything we can in our power to help you to achieve that goal. You let us know 
as the next weeks and months and years go by, what we can do as public policymakers uh, to help you complete this task. Thank you all so, so much. This hearing is adjourned. You're all invited to go out the door, down one flight of steps, and go out and get a glimpse of the future. Thank you. Yeah, let's go up.